What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Playmakers Corner Podcast. I'm your host for today, Simon Villanos, a.k.a. Coach V. And I'm back at it with more season previews for this next 2022 Colorado High School football team. I got 10 teams lined up here from all over the state, 1A through 5A, so a lot of variety here. And you know what? This is part of our series where we're going to talk about every single 11-man football team here in the state of Colorado before the 2022 season. Now, I just got to throw this out there, man. We're going to talk about their season last year, the players they're leaving, whether it's by graduation, transfer, moving, whatever. Key players to look out for this year. And then we're going to go ahead and predict records and uh, give them a window of wins. And window of wins basically means the range of wins that they that we project them to win uh, this season Usually seasons are about 8 to 10 or 11 games long, uh, no less than 8, usually no more than 11, so there you go. Just keep that in mind, you know, and then when I say over or under 500, that's like the halfway point. Some people don't know, so I gotta just throw that out there here in the intro. Then on top of that, I'm gonna say this as well. I ain't going to defend your team if I really don't feel like they have an opportunity to win a game. I'm not going to give them the benefit of the doubt unless I have a real good reason outside of the fact that, you know, oh, they're always good. That's not a good enough reason for me. I just want to throw that out there because I know we've had a couple too many complainers. And you know what? I'd say that to your face as well. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our first team that we're going to talk about here. Douglas County. So here's how their season went, 6-4 and four in the regular season, 0-1 in the playoffs. Uh, this is probably their best record here in a couple years, almost 10 years actually, in the first time they made the playoffs in a bit as well. But they started off this season with a 45-0 dub over Mountain Range, a 49-21 dub over North Glen, a 48-19 dub versus Prairie View, and then me, myself, and the PMC crew went to the Battle of the Rock versus Castleview lit game. Uh, hopefully looking to go this year. We'll see about that. We'll, we'll see how the schedules turn out and whatnot. But the, uh, last year's game was absolutely insane. Douglas County beat Castleview in a dominant way, 16 to zero uh place was rocking the whole time and it was relatively close leading up into the second half i would say so there you go big dub big rivalry dub there then they beat boulder 34 7 beat doherty 26 8 then they had to go play pine creek went to that game watched it briefly but pine creek eventually beat them 35 to 7 then they played legend who they lost to 49 7 played chaparral who they lost to 35 32 uh, played Regis Jesuit, who they lost to 34-24, so last four or five games, a real tough go there for Douglas County. But regardless, it was good enough for them to make the playoffs. Uh, they pulled Mullen in the first round and unfortunately lost to them uh, 34-7, to kind of by a lot here. Now, let's talk about the graduating seniors who really contributed to that squad, starting with A.J. Jackson. He was the number one ranked quarterback in the class of 2022, at least for us. Uh, he passed for 1,693 yards, 14 touchdowns, so 11 picks. A little sloppy, especially at the end there, but also rushed for 732 yards and 7 touchdowns. He also played uh, cornerback, which is kind of something you don't see every day, especially on the 5 year level, but at cornerback, he had 38 tackles and a pick, and he was also the starting kicker slash punter for this Douglas County team as well, and so he really never came off the field at all. Uh, definitely a big time athlete. They are losing one of the best, if not the best, in the entire state last year. On top of that, they're losing their starting running back, Tyler Stonebreaker. He was actually the second leading rusher uh, right behind Jackson here with 676 rushing yards and eight rushing touchdowns. They're also losing Ian Tappen. Um, he was the sack leader with four. He also had 29 tackles on defense. And then on defense altogether, they're not actually losing that many people. They're only losing three of their top 11 tacklers. That includes Jackson and Tappen as well. And uh, on the line, they are losing a couple players, which they're definitely going to miss here. Uh, they're losing three starting offensive linemen in Tanner Fleck. Taylor Nichols, who was an excellent guard, by the way. Uh, I believe he was an interior lineman honorable mention. And Connor Berry. So that's three offensive linemen they're losing. And that's probably one of their biggest losses outside of this backfield 
here. Now, let's talk key players because even though Douglas County is losing some key players, they got some players in the background that are going to step up here and do their thing and lead them to another positive record, hopefully, here. And that starts with Davis Lish. Uh, he will be the starting quarterback as a junior. Uh, should be the guy to take over and on top of that He's also one of the better safeties in the state got to look at his film and his safety film is very good You know good ball skills tax the ball well covers both well and man and zone and so he'll contribute to both sides of the ball just like his predecessor uh, AJ Jackson I actually got to see some of uh, Lish's film here some seven on seven film against Valor Christian and he made some really good throws like some tight accurate great timing throws and i know it's seven on seven but right now in the off season that's the best we could go off of especially when you have you know inexperienced players at certain positions and he looked good so i feel good about uh, where he's at right now he can also run a little bit like i said he plays safety on the other side and so it'll be really interesting to see how good of a quarterback he is stepping into that role that aj jackson was in last year i don't think there will be that much of a drop off i think he's talented enough to pick up you know relatively the same place where this douglas county was last year relatively not exactly the same place uh, but he will have some help in the form of number one wide receiver chase nelson he was the number one wide out last year as a junior Going into this senior year, he's going to be one of the best athletes on this team, period. He's one of those guys that, you know, you really don't want to have in one-on-one -on -one just because he has a legitimate 4-4-4-5 speed. He burns a lot of corners. You look at the film, you know, when they're in one-on-one -on -one and it's a kid that's not as fast as him, he absolutely sauces them, burns them. And so he's somebody that's going to draw double teams naturally. But he's also somebody that, you know, you can look at uh, for Douglas County to really just try to get the ball to because he's one of their playmakers. You know, and so if that means giving him uh, the ball on handoffs, sweeps, tosses, you'll probably see that this season because uh, it did happen a little bit last season. He's just one of those speedsters that you know, has the ability to not only get you a nice chunk of yards, but he has the ability to hit a home run, and there's not much you could do about it. So he's poised for a huge senior season. Definitely somebody that we are considering for our top five senior wide receivers in the class of 2023, despite being a little undersized, but that speed is legitimate. So got to keep out for Chase Nelson. He's going to do his thing there. Uh, another guy that's going to step up here more so on offense but had a role on defense is Jake Stonebreaker. He will be a junior linebacker, but he also, or yeah, he will be a junior linebacker, um, but he's going to probably be the starter at running back. Uh, he'll be an important part of both units here, both on defense and offense. Look for, for him to be an absolute leader here while taking on some extra responsibilities at running back. Like his brother, he's a tough runner, but he is a bigger player, a little bit taller, a little bit heavier. So he's gonna, you know, he's gonna be a bruiser for sure uh, down low doing his thing. Look for him to really be a workhorse for this team. And then that linebacker, he's a pretty good linebacker. Good hands, covers well, you know, plays the run well. Definitely somebody to look out for um, just for this next season here for Douglas County. He'll help keep this defense together. That is already pretty experienced. And so with him coming back and guys like Davis Lish coming back and the rest of their core on defense, this defense should be pretty solid. Uh, and I just want to shout out the defensive unit. Like I said, they're returning a pretty experienced group. They are losing some guys like AJ Jackson, Ian Tappen. But other than that, this is pretty much the exact same squad, the exact same linebacker squad. Your secondary is mostly intact outside of, you know, a corner that you're losing, a DB that you're losing. And so, like I said, this defense should be pretty solid. Now, I don't know if they'll be top five or top ten, but they'll be experienced enough. And so, you know, inexperienced offenses are just going to naturally struggle. So, just keep that in mind. Now, let's go ahead and predict the record. Go game by game here so they play horizon to start the season i think they're going to come out with the dub here uh horizon's going to be a tough squad this season and i'm just going to throw this out there the few times douglas county played a good quarterback last season they got blown out and alex birch is a good quarterback you know he had a good season as a freshman uh as a sophomore he's looking to have an even better season 
you know, and I got to see some of his off-season film, and he's looking pretty good, you know, look for him to run and throw the ball and do his thing there, and so this defense is going to have their hands full to start, but I'm going to go with this experienced Douglas County squad, specifically their defense, and the firepower of their offense to go ahead and get this one done. I think this will be a pretty you know a pretty close game and so it will be a good test but i'll give douglas county the edge here after that they play thunder ridge i don't think they're going to win this game i think the big question is more so for thunder ridge and that's going to be who is their quarterback going into this season uh they could either start the freshman uh, in dj bordeaux or they have a senior quarterback who they could play but you know, he could definitely not do some of the things that DJ could do. And that's no disrespect. That's just, I mean, a lot of quarterbacks can't do the things DJ could do. So that'll be a big question, especially this early on in the season. But regardless, Thunder Ridge still has a very dominant defense. They've been looking very good. And so they're going to put in work against this Douglas County offense that is just not as experienced and might not be clicking right away. And so if there are issues there, you know, clicking and whatnot, and you have a new quarterback, new running back, that could be trouble for Douglas County. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this dub to Thunder Ridge. Uh, and so to start the season, they're 1-1. After that, though, they play Rangeview. I think I think Douglas County should win this game. Uh, there's no reason they should really lose this game, considering Rangeview is losing their entire defense, basically. And so they should take care of business here. After that, we got the Battle of the Rock uh, versus Castleview. This is going to be one of the littest game of the year. If you could go there, you got to go there. Because uh, it will be one of the best football games here in Colorado. Love the stadium. Love the atmosphere. It was great last year. I think it will be great this year. And, and honestly, you could expect an absolute battle. Uh, I'm going to give it to Castleview this time around. Just barely. You know, this is definitely one of those toss-up games because it is a rivalry game. But in my opinion, the QB with the better game will win this game. And so I'm going to give the nod to Castleview who had a quarterback who had the first taste of this rivalry last year compared to, you know, this Douglas County quarterback who did play in the game but did not play quarterback last year. So, we'll see. I really do think the best quarterback will win this game and that'll you'll, you'll know the answer after that rivalry game. But for now, I'm going to give this one to Castleview. I think they'll avenge themselves from last year. After that, they play Fairview. Don't get it twisted. I know that news about Beckham Kritza leaving for California is a big deal, but that doesn't mean they don't have a quarterback. Uh, look to junior quarterback Rowan Reisner to take over, and he'll get his chance finally. And I've got to see him. I've got to see him play for a minute now. I've followed him since I want to say his freshman year. Well, not really got to see him work in this offseason with that Ducks 7 on 7 team, and he's gotten better. And he looks really good in the offseason stuff that, you know, my people have seen so far. And so there's not going to be as big a drop off as you could probably expect here. And so just for that, uh, I think Fairview is going to win this one. It's going to be all hands on deck for Douglas County. Defensively, they got to be sharp. And offensively, you can't leave points on the board. You just can't. And this Fairview team is very talented, and I think they might just have a little bit more than Douglas County here. And so that's why I'm uh, marking this one up as a loss. After that, they play Regis Jesuit. I think just straight up, uh, they're going to be outmatched here. This one's going to be a loss. Uh, check out check out Friday's episode, episode 186, if you want to hear more about Regis. So there you go. Then they play Chaparral, uh, another team I talked about on episode 186. I think they get the dub against Chaparral, get a little bit of a break here after, you know, a tough couple weeks uh, leading up to this game. And so I think they go ahead and beat Chaparral here, who is losing a lot. But then they play Fountain for Carson. I don't think they can win this one. That Fountain for Carson defense is going to be really good, led by Ty Fave. And so they may struggle against them. But if Fountain for Carson's offense is struggling, then maybe this one's a little bit closer. But I still give the edge to Fountain for Carson. They play Pine Creek next. Pine Creek's going to be real good. Absolutely a contender, so I don't think they can beat them necessarily. And then they play Legend. I think they should beat Legend. Uh, look, this Legend team has a lot of young players. I know there was kind of a big outcry from that community talking about, oh, I think that evaluation was unfair. 
I don't think it's unfair. Until you have a passing game, until you have a starting quarterback, until you have a proven running backs, because right now they were both backups last year, you got to give me more than a reason to believe in you outside than the fact that, oh, you're a legend, so you should naturally beat Douglas County. I think right now Douglas County has a more experienced defense. I think right now they have a better trio that is experienced as well outside of Davis Lish, but Jake Stonebreaker and Chase Nelson both proved themselves and had good years last year. Uh, Stonebreaker being a backup to his brother, so I'm going to give this one to Douglas County, and I don't really feel bad about it. Altogether, though, my predicted record for Douglas County is four and six, with a window of wins anywhere between two and five. Uh, a pretty, a pretty big window of wins here. I'm not even gonna lie. Uh, this is a team that's gonna take a step back, losing so many linemen. I think that's just gonna be a natural thing. I don't think they're gonna get to six wins necessarily. I'd be a little bit surprised here, but you know, uh, they have enough talent to finish relatively close to 500 relatively close but unfortunately this schedule is just harder than last year's and i think this team i mean they are losing kind of a bit we'll know what kind of team they are uh after this season for sure and we'll have a better i guess feel for this offense specifically going to next year but I just think, you know, they're losing so many linemen. They're losing Stonebreaker and Jackson. That's kind of a lot to make up for. But they'll still win a couple games, so I'm going to give it to them. Anyways, let's move on. Have a quick change of direction here. Talk about wide field. Uh, so last year, went 4-5. and five. They lost to Fountain Fort Carson 48-0. Lost to Air Academy 2014. Um, lost to Mace Ridge 35-0. And lost to Golden 35-14 to start the season. But then they got dubs over Palmer, 48-6, Thornton, 42-0. Lost the Falcon in a relatively closer one, 23-13. But then ended the season with two dubs against Liberty, 42-0, and Cheyenne Mountain, 33-31. They were part of that I-25 league in 4A, so just keep that in mind. So altogether, not too bad of a season. Now, some of the seniors they are losing, this is kind of a big deal. They're losing DJ Allen. In my opinion, he was arguably the best player and best athlete this team had. He rushed for 403 yards and six touchdowns, caught 23 receptions for 312 yards and five receiving touchdowns. Then on defense, he had 41 tackles and two interceptions. And so that all around production will be missed. You know, having a 6'3, 200 pound athlete that could run, that's not something you see every day. And so that It'll be very tough to replace there. On top of that, they're also losing Josh Deal at cornerback. He had 34 tackles and then led the team with in interceptions with five. And so that's a blow to the secondary. And then in addition, they're losing Cody Wilson at free safety. Another blow to the secondary. Uh, he had 32 tackles and four sacks, which led the team. Um, altogether, wide field, they're losing six of their top 11 tacklers. But it does look like they're losing the almost majority of their defensive line, if not their entire defensive line, which is pretty concerning uh, considering, you know, how much uh, they contributed to their success or what success they had last year. Now, key players to look out for, I think um, the biggest player the biggest name to look out for is paul mitchell uh this quarterback as a sophomore took over in the last couple games and he really put up some nice performances from the falcon game on uh, against shine mountain which i believe was an upset win he threw for 227 yards and three touchdowns to one pick against liberty went 145 yards and one touchdown no turnovers and so let's see if he continues to take those steps forward going into his junior year and i did get to look at some of his film from his off-season camp uh i believe over at western and he looked pretty good you know throwing some dots here maneuvering the pocket moving up in the pocket delivering uh some pretty good strikes and whatnot and so i am pretty excited about paul mitchell getting another start here another chance here going into his junior year now Another guy I want y'all to keep an eye out for is Gabriel Segura. Um, he was previously at quarterback last year, but it seemed like they went with Mitchell at quarterback to end the season basically for that last month. That doesn't mean he didn't contribute anything though to this team as he did well at receiver the last month catching 
uh, four receptions for 39 yards against Liberty, and then went two for 72 yards and a touchdown against Cheyenne Mountain. He also rushed for 301 yards and a touchdown. So he's an athlete, and regardless, should make an impact as a skill player this time around. He will be a senior this year, and so hopefully gets plenty of play time and gets some film out there because he is a good athlete. And so a little bit, a little bit of a position change here, but I think it might be for the best so that they could best use him. And then last but not least, uh, another guy to look out for is Braden Burroughs uh, D'Amatos. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Excuse me if I'm not, though. But last year, it was the lead rusher with 467 yards and five rushing touchdowns. He had a lot of productive games. Um, didn't play in a lot of games, though. Just throwing that out there. But look for him to be the lead back uh, this year. Our defense, he also uh, was a tackle leader with 49 tackles and three Sacks, and then I almost forgot wanted to throw this other name out there Nathaniel Hoyt He was the lead receiver for this team with 323 yards and four touchdowns. He will be returning as Well, and so despite losing, you know quite a bit on defense some key impact players on defense They're returning a pretty nice core here on offense uh, centered around this quarterback here in Paul Mitchell, who, if he takes a step forward, then this offense would take a step forward straight up. But let's go ahead and predict the record, talk about the schedule here. They play Harrison to start the season. I think this is going to be a loss. The thing concerning me most about Widefield is the front line, uh, defensive and offensively. And so that's the thing that concerns me the least about Harrison. And so I think if Harrison could control the line of scrimmage, then... You know, that might be a very tough game to win. Now, if Paul Mitchell has an absolutely elite game, then, you know, I could see this game being flipped, but he's going to have to be on his toes to start the season because they're going to be coming for him uh, here in this Harrison game. So for that, I'm going to give this one to Harrison, though, just because um, just because of those reasons. Then they play Air Academy. Uh, last year's game was pretty close. I think this year will be pretty close as well. I think this will be a good opportunity for Paul Mitchell to, you know, really have a good game and, you know, let it be known that he's out here and light them up. But I'm going to be honest, I'm counting on Sam Beers and company to take care of business against a team that, like I said, is losing their entire defensive line while Air Academy is returning a lot of that line and Sam Beers. And so I think the key to that game is to stop Sam Beers. And so we'll see if they could do it or not. But with an inexperienced defensive line, that might be a lot to ask for. Eventually, though, they catch a break here. They do play Pueblo Centennial, who I think uh, they should easily beat here. Not going to lie. Uh, no disrespect to them or anything like that. But they should beat this Pueblo Centennial team. Then they play Thornton. I think this is another win for them. Uh, they beat them by a lot last year. And this year, they should at least beat them. Maybe by not as much, but they should at least beat them. Uh, Widefield will be returning enough skill players. And, you know, with a quarterback, I think this is definitely a winnable game. More than a winnable game. I think they're favored in this one. Then they play Mace Ridge. I think this one's going to be a close one, but I think it's going to be a loss despite a Mace Ridge rebuild. They got a stud in Isaiah Jones, who I think is going to be an absolute star this season. And so he's going to challenge this defense on the ground, you know. He's going to force this defense to grow up quickly. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this one to Mace Ridge. Still might be kind of a closer game, though, but... I think, you know, they got to find a way to stop this star running back here. And I, I don't know if they got those guys right now uh, on that line. So we'll see. Then they play Gateway. I think that's an easy dub here. They take care of business here. They play Hinkley. Um... The Hinkley was is kind of a harder team to get a get a vibe on just because they had a much harder schedule last year. This year they're in a much more, you know, competitive league, at least for them. And so this is probably gonna be a competitive game, but I'm gonna give it to Widefield here. Uh, especially because, you know, they should be, you know, kind of on a roll here, winning a couple games and whatnot. And I, I like this offensive core that Widefield has as well, at least over Hinkley's. And they do have a quarterback, so just be careful there. But uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and favor Widefield here. Then they play Palmer. Should take care of business this game. Get another dub. After that, they play Centaurus. This one's probably going to be a closer game like Hinkley. Centaurus had a much harder schedule last year. This year, they're in a much more competitive league. 
and so we'll see what happens. I think Centaurus is definitely going to put up some points and, you know, make <laughs> make Whitefield sweat this one out. But I think they should take care of business and get the dub. Then they play Liberty here. Another team that I feel like they're just better than and they should get the dub. Altogether, my predicted record, my predicted record for Whitefield here is 7-3 and three, with a window of wins anywhere between 6 and 8. Uh, look, Whitefield will be playing a much more favorable schedule this year, at least compared to last year, which contributes to how good I'm predicting the record to be. But they also have a quarterback in Paul Mitchell who could get a lot of production out of the skill players that Whitefield has right now because they do have some skill players. But, you know, they don't do you much good unless you got a quarterback, in my honest opinion. And I think they do got one in Paul here. Now, the defense for Whitefield will need to shape up as the year goes on, though. Uh, losing so many on that front seven is going to be a big blow, so just keep an eye out for that. But I legitimately think that Whitefield should go over 500, uh, maybe flipping some games here and there, but I think they for sure should go over 500 and be at least in the talks for playoffs. So we'll see about that. Let's move on, though, and talk about another team in Whitefield's league here, Thornton high school last year went four and six uh lost the north glen 30 to six and then dakota ridge 42 to 14 to start the season but then got a dub over littleton 40 to 18 uh lost the centaurs 41 to zero after that beat mountain range though in a close one 26 to 21 then lost to uh, cheyenne mountain 53 to six lost to widefield 42 0 then beat liberty 33 14 beat palmer 36 16 and then lost a very close one to Falcon to end the season 28 to 26. Now, let's talk about some of the players they're losing here, starting with their star athlete, Miles Pohl. He'll be going to CSU Pueblo, but he was arguably the best athlete on this team and just one of the best athletes in the entire state. Uh, only athlete to rush for 1,170 yards and 10 touchdowns. Uh, by the way, also caught six receptions for 119 yards and a touchdown and then on defense had 108 tackles three sacks and eight picks so he was the only athlete in the entire state to both rush 4,000 yards and have 108 tackles um or one of the only ones i think mason clanch in the 1a levels might have been close there but other than that, it's not every day you see this kind of athlete, and so he's going to be missed. It's going to be extremely difficult to replace the production of a Miles Pole because he's just built different like that. On top of that, they're losing their starting quarterback, Isaiah Reese. Uh, threw for 1,244 yards, 9 touchdowns, 7 picks. Also rushed for 140 yards and 3 touchdowns, and so that's a tough leadership to be losing there. And then on top of that, um, they're, lose they're losing, I think it's... Leonel Uribe? Uribe? Excuse me if I'm saying that wrong, but he uh, he was a starting lineman for them, I believe, on offense and defense, and had 43 tackles and three and a half sacks and led the team in sacks. Now, key players to look out for for this Thornton team is Isaac Gomez. Uh, I think he's going to be one of the best athletes for this team and in the state. Uh, he was the lead receiver for 53 receptions. 646 receiving yards and five receiving touchdowns but he was mostly known known as a defensive player as he was a 4a defensive player of the year candidate snagging 27 tackles and seven interceptions on the year that's uh one of he was one of the leaders and picks here in colorado and in my opinion he's a next level player should be in line for a bigger role uh, on this team as a leader being that best athlete or one of the better athletes and so be on the lookout for him to make an impact on offense and defense absolute stud there another guy to look out for caleb gutierrez paz uh he was the second leading receiver with 333 yards and two receiving touchdowns also held it down at corner snagging 22 tackles in a pick him returning with Gomez should help hold down the secondary. And then last but not least, you have Alfredo Castillo. He is one of the best, uh, well, one of the best and biggest players on this team. And he's one of the most experienced players having, you know, varsity snaps since he was a freshman. And now he's going into his senior year. This 6'1", 310-pound lineman had 31 tackles as a junior look for him to be a force on both sides of the ball i'm sure they're going to double team him and uh, other teams are going to try to adjust to him there so 
there you go. That's going to be the core of Thornton going into this year. Let's go ahead and talk about their schedule, predict the record here. So to start the season, they played two 3A teams in Skyview and Nahuatl. Uh, look, no disrespect towards them. You know, they're they're all right programs. I wouldn't say they're top tier 3A programs. And so in my opinion, they should beat both of those uh, pretty easily there. After that, they play North Glen. Now, both teams are losing players. But to be honest, if North Glen was able to blow out this team uh, last year, that they may be able to do the same this year, especially with questions of quarterback for Thornton. I don't know who their quarterback is going to be and uh, how well he might do as well, not having varsity experience before. So there you go. I'm going to go ahead and give this uh, game to North Glen and favor them there. Then they play Widefield. I talked about this game. Um, I think they're going to lose to them. If you want to listen to more reasons why, go ahead and listen to that last Widefield segment. So there you go. After that, they play Gateway, and honestly... I'm not sure what Gateway's identity is. Uh, they got a new, you know, coach last year. They lost a lot of players. But for now, I just believe more in the Thornton culture and program. And on top of that, uh, they have more established players and kind of a tougher secondary as well. So I'm going to give this one to Thornton. They're going to win that one. Then they play Hinkley. This might be a close game. This will probably be a close game. And so it will be an interesting one. Uh, Hinkley... Like I said, playing a much more easier schedule than last year. They do have a dual threat quarterback who showed flashes last year. And so he may be able to cause some trouble for this Thornton team. Especially if they can't match them offensively. Which is probably my biggest concern. I know Thornton has some DBs that will do their thing on defense and whatnot. But I'm probably more concerned about this Thornton offense than defense. And so for that, I'm going to give Hinkley the slight edge here in what should be a close game. Uh, then they play Palmer. They should beat them. I don't have any trouble, you know, giving them the dub there. Then they play Centaurus. I think this one's going to be a loss. Uh, will probably be a closer game than last year, but they are returning a running back in Ben. I think it's Mishki, who went for a season-high 152 yards and a touchdown on Thornton last year. And so without a great linebacker this year in Miles Poole, he might be too tough to handle for this Thornton team. And so we'll see. It's going to be a close game, a closer game, but... Like I said, this is just one of those situations where, you know, losing such a great athlete in Miles Pool, it's not so easy to replace. It's not every day you find a guy like that. So there you go. But no worries. They bounce back and they should beat Liberty here and handle that team. Then to end the season, they play Aurora Central. Aurora Central is a team that has a lot of talent and running backs who are talented. And so I think that might be a little bit too much for Thornton to handle here as they're going to have to be on their P's and Q's defensively to really keep this one close. But I'm going to go ahead and give Aurora Central the edge here. Altogether, uh, Thornton's predicted record here is 5-5 five and five, with a window of wins anywhere between 3 and 6. Uh, this team will have a much easier schedule this year compared to last year, but unfortunately, losing the likes of Miles Poole and their starting quarterback in uh, Reese, that's tough. You know, you, that's not an easy replace at all. And so Thornton needs to find a quarterback who could utilize the great skill players they have. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, Gomez, Gutierrez, Paz, all those guys over there. And then on top of that, we'll see how he does being a first-year starter. But for now, they have plenty of, uh, they have a pretty wide range here. You know, either they win at least three games, which I think they should win at least three games, or they just barely get over 500. Some of these games, like I said, are just going to be toss-up ones depending on who they decide their quarterback will be and how well he ultimately plays at the end of the day. So we'll see about that. But that is my prediction for Thornton High School. Moving on, though, we're going to move down to the 1A levels and talk about a small program here in Cedar Ridge. Last year, had a tough season, went 3-6. and six. Uh, This is how their season went, lost to Montezuma Cortez 26-12, beat Coleridge 28-0. Then they lost to Meeker 40-6, Monta Vista 32-6, Gunnison 35-0. After that three-game losing streak, they bounced back, beat Olaf 39-8. Then they lost to Grand Valley 37-6, uh, lost to North Fork 50-12, but then ended the season with a dub over Roaring Fork 34-0. Uh, let's talk about some seniors they're losing. They're not losing a whole ton. At least this, I don't think this team's losing a whole ton here, but uh, Ty Walk, he was one of their starting quarterbacks for this team at one point in the season. Threw for 507 yards, 4 touchdowns, 7 picks. 
uh, rushed for 331 yards and two touchdowns. He was also uh, one of the team's leading tacklers with 65 um, and he was the leading passer for this team, just barely, and then the second leading rusher and the lead tackler for this squad. So, did a lot for this team, you know, on both sides of the ball, but he is graduated. They're also losing Lane Hunsberger. He rushed for 423 yards and two touchdowns while catching five balls for 42 yards. He was also one of the lead tacklers for this team with 42. He was the leading rusher and the second leading tackler for the squad altogether this team only losing four of their top 11 tacklers including those two guys i talked about and they're losing at least two linemen but it looks like they're returning three so that's a pretty good deal here now let's talk about some key players because this cedar ridge team is very young but i think they're on the come up here and that starts with brady cooper he was a freshman of the year candidate uh last year for us he caught 22 balls for 239 yards and six receiving touchdowns as a freshman he also contributed 37 tackles and two picks he was one of the best athletes on this team if not already the best one on this team right now now another guy to look out for is logan tullis as a sophomore he caught 25 balls for 363 yards and two touchdowns was the lead receiver on the squad he also had 38 tackles on defense and then last but not least this guy is kind of leading the youth movement over at Cedar Ridge, Luke Maxey, who will probably be the starting quarterback this year, uh, coming off a nice sophomore year where he threw for 500 yards and six touchdowns to one interception in four games. He had some impressive showings even in losses, and this next year could be a breakout year for him. Uh, by the way, on defense, also had seven tackles and led, led the team in interceptions with four. So there you go, a very young Cedar Ridge team. They are returning a lot of players from last year who got playing time as juniors and underclassmen. And so this is going to be a young squad that will hopefully make a little bit more noise here. And so to start the season, they play Payton. And I have Cedar Ridge winning this one. I think their offense will have the opportunity to really put the state on notice. Payton, they're losing a lot. You know, this is a team that won their league and made the playoffs. But they are losing a lot. Basically, their entire backfield and a lot of their um, big-time impact players on defense. And so this would be a great opportunity to go ahead and steal a dub here for Cedar Ridge. After that, they play Grand Valley. There should be a win here. Uh, Grand Valley got blown out last year, but going into this year, this game will probably be a little bit closer. Doesn't matter, though. I'm still giving it to Cedar Ridge. I think they have the slight edge with a more mature skill group that now has had a year to work with each other uh, and a quarterback looking to avenge uh, last year. Excuse me, sorry. Cedar Ridge got blown out last year, and so... I think this game will be a lot closer and uh, Cedar Ridge will avenge that loss from last year with a more mature skill group and quarterback. That's what I meant. Excuse me there. Uh, but after that, they played Del Norte. I think I'm going to give them the dub here. I favored them in this game uh, against a team that is just losing a little bit more than Cedar Ridge. So there you go. Experience matters. After that, they play Olaf. That should be a dub. They should take care of this squad just like last year. Then they play North Fork. I'm going to predict this one as a win, but it's going to be a close game. Uh, North Fork is not returning a lot of experience uh, on either side of the ball, losing the more majority of their defense, and then a lot of key players are running back and wide receiver. Now it's North Fork. They do a good job of replacing players. They're a great program like that. But I think for now, with the players available, with the players that played, you know, in previous years, I'm going to give the edge to Cedar Ridge in this one. Don't be surprised if North Fork wins it, though. Then they play Meeker. I think this one will be a loss. Cedar Ridge, um, they haven't beat Meeker in years. And so despite them losing some key players, they should still be pretty strong. You know, that front seven is still pretty strong here. And so this m may be a closer game. But I think Meeker will find a way to get it done, especially at this point in the season. I think they'll figure out who their main guy on offense will be, and they'll go ahead and beat Cedar Ridge. Just having a better front seven, in my opinion. Then they play Gunnison. I think this one will be a loss. Uh, should be a closer game, but I think Gunnison will find a way to pull it out with uh, the experience they have in their core. Uh, don't be surprised if this game flips, though, and Cedar Ridge gets the upset. I think that could definitely happen, but for now, I think Gunnison is the safe choice here. Then to end the season, they play Roaring Fork. That should be a dub just like it was 
last year. Altogether, my predicted record for Cedar Ridge is 6-2 with a window of wins anywhere between 5 and 7. Look for a significant improvement from Cedar Ridge this year. They should win more than 3 games uh, and potentially make the playoffs. This passing offense has the potential to be one of the best in 1A and in the state. And so we'll see if they reach it. You'll probably see flashes of it. Um, but for now, you know, I think Cedar Ridge should for sure improve on their three win uh, record from last year and win anywhere between five to seven games. All right, now let's move on. Let's talk about Gunnison. Last year, won 7-2, 0-1 in playoffs, but still made playoffs. Uh, this is how their season went. They beat Del Norte 18-12, beat Grand Valley 17-7, beat Dove Creek 24-14. Some really close games to start. Uh, but then they blew out Olaf 51-8, beat Cedar Ridge 35-0, beat Colorado Springs Christian 33-20, then lost to Meeker 28-12. Bounce back, beat Roaring Fork 34-0, then lost the North Fork uh, 42-6. And then to end the season in the first round, lost to Buena Vista 42-14. Altogether, a pretty good season here, making the playoffs and having a nice regular season there. Now, some seniors who really contributed to that success is Sam Buchanan. Uh, he was the lead rusher for this team with 550 yards and 8 touchdowns. Also, co-led in tackles with 45. Another guy they're losing is Caleb Vincent, was the second leading rusher with 458 yards and 3 touchdowns. He also had 34 tackles and went for 6 sacks. Uh, altogether, losing 4 of their top 11 tacklers, not as bad as it could be there. Now, key players that Gunnison is returning is their quarterback, and excuse me if I say this wrong, I apologize, because uh, I know I'm going to say it wrong here, is Rocky Marchitelli, I want to say. He threw for 419 yards, three touchdowns, five picks. Uh, going into the senior year, he will be a leader at quarterback, and definitely a player to look out for. We'll see if he can take a step forward, clean up that ratio there. Uh, another guy they're bringing back is Royce Urig. He was, uh, he was like third or fourth on the depth chart as far as running backs go, but he rushed for 245 yards and five touchdowns. Um, Peyton Fries, he's another guy that will be returning in that backfield. He was a backup who rushed for 275 yards, and so those two should lead this backfield here. They got experience on varsity from last year, and so that's always good um, there. Peyton by the way, he was also one of the top tacklers for this team. Uh, I believe he was the other co-leader in tackles with 45. And he should be a leader for this defense that is returning, you know, quite a bit. They're returning seven of their top 11 tacklers. That's a good majority there. So Gunnison, I mean, you know, they lost some guys, but they're returning a lot of players here. And so let me go ahead and predict the record here. Um, they play Aspen. In my opinion, they were a pretty solid 2A team from last year, and I think Gunnison may struggle against them this year. Should be a closer game, though. Uh, but still, though, predicting it as a loss. Then they play 2A Alamosa. Uh, this Alamosa team will probably be a top team in 2A, which makes them a very tough matchup, so I'm giving this one to Alamosa. Then they play Monta Vista, and this is a Monta Vista team that will be very good this year. Uh, I think they'll be a playoff team for sure, and so they're going to challenge Gunnison. And Gunnison will have to play a very good game for this game to be close. And if it's close, then anything could happen, but I think Monta Vista is just the better team here, and they should get the dub. Then they play Buena Vista, another contender. And I just don't think Gunnison is quite a contender here, and so unfortunately this one is a loss. Then they play Olaf, who they should beat. Played Roaring Fork, uh, who I feel like they should beat. So there you go. Then they play Cedar Ridge. I think this one's a dub. Uh, Gunnison has slightly more varsity experience. So I expect them to win this one. But it will be a close game. And they will need to come ready to play. They can't underestimate this group. Uh, this young Cedar Ridge group. So there you go. Then they play Meeker. Meeker is losing a you know, a lot, as in they're losing a lot in Kelton and Turner, but they are returning a tough defense that should challenge a lot of teams, even if they don't have the offense to match. But I think uh, at this point in the season, Meeker will figure something out. And so it might be a close game, but Meeker is always pretty good, and they'll find a way to replace that production on offense while having a very strong defense. So unfortunately, this one's a loss. Then they play North Fork, and I expect them by this point... Um, in the system for North Fork to figure out their team 
figure out who's going to be in what role and all that stuff at this point in the season. And so uh, they're going to have players replacing the open spots they have. This will probably be a pl um, this will probably be a close game. Excuse me, but I'm going to give it to a strong North Fork program who. I think this will definitely be a rebuilding year. This might even be a toss-up game, but North Fork, they have a great talent pool over there. I think they will be able to just barely sneak this one out. So my predicted record for this Gunnison team is 3-6 and six, with a window of wins anywhere between 3-5. and five. Uh, I don't think they'll make the playoffs, but I think they will have a respectable record that's close to 500. If they finish at 500 or better, they might be able to make the playoffs based on strength of schedule because this schedule is, is a lot tougher than last year's schedule. They're playing a lot of very good teams, a lot of good 2A teams, and some top tier 1A teams here. And so um, they might make the playoffs if they reach 500 or over just because of that strength of schedule. But they have a lot to prove, and this backfield absolutely needs to step up for them to win closer games. If this backfield does step up, you know, I could really see them flipping a couple games here, winning, you know, five, maybe even six games. But I think five games is probably a realistic, ga uh, realistic guess at most. So there you go. All right, now let's move up to two-way here, and let's talk about Valley High School and this program over in Gilchrist, I believe. Last year had a tough season, won two and seven. Lost to Steamboat Springs 28-15, lost to Wiggins 45-0, lost to University 42-6, and then lost to Alameda 28-27. But got a dub versus Fort Lupton 34-23, then lost to a two-way team in Rush who went to state 61-14. Beat Weld Central 28-16, lost to Sterling 43-22, then lost to Platte Valley 27-21. So a very tough uh, year for Valley here. Now they are losing some seniors. Uh, Colin Brown, he was their lead rusher with 611 yards, three touchdowns. He was also a top tackler with 57 tackles and two sacks. Um, they're also losing Giovanni Mendoza. He was a two-way defensive player of the year candidate. He was the lead receiver also for this team with 525 yards and six touchdowns. And on defense at 38 tackles and a state high eight interceptions. Then they're also losing Evan Gillette or Evan Gillette, excuse me if I'm saying that wrong, but another DB uh, who had 41 tackles and four picks on the season. Altogether, this defense is losing six of their top 11 tacklers. Um, a lot of those guys, though, in the secondary. Now, key players to look out for, Carson Adolph uh, started at quarterback as a freshman for this Valley squad. Um, had about a year you could expect from a freshman, throwing for 730 yards, eight touchdowns, 12 picks, but... Look for him to take a step forward as he goes into his second year as the starter. Then you have Julian Ramirez. He was the backup running back last year, but had some big games and won for 276 yards and two touchdowns. As a junior, he will be the guy, so look out for him to have a much more productive season, have a little bit of a breakout season as well. Then you have Aiden Trujillo. Um, this incoming senior lineman is 6'2", 280 pounds, will be a key returner for this offense. And then on defense, he also had 43 tackles, some three sacks, and so you love uh, you love it whenever you're returning size there, so there you go. And last but not least, you got Blake Herman at linebacker. This incoming senior led the team with tackles with uh, 67, and then he also had two picks. He should be returning um, as the leader of this defense and one of the leaders of this squad. So, you know, not a tough year, but they are a pretty young program. And so we're going to see some guys hopefully step up this year. But um, let's go ahead and predict the season, talk about it. So they play Bertha to start. I think this is going to be an L uh, for for Valley. Both of these teams are in similar spots in 2A, but Berthoud, I think, is going to be returning a couple more experienced players here, and so I'm going to give them the slight edge in this one. Definitely could be a toss-up game, though. Then they play Manitou Springs. Ooh, this Manitou Springs squad should be able to take care of uh, this Valley team. Manitou Springs is going to be pretty good there. They have a quarterback. They have a couple really nice skill players, and so I'm going to go ahead and give this one to Manitou Springs. After that, though, they play Fort Lupton, and this will be a hard-fought game. Last year, Gio Mendoza put his signature on this game and was big time on offense and defense. Now, without him, it will be up to the other guys to find a way to get it done, and I think they can, and so I'm going to give this one to Valley here over Fort Lupton. 
Then they play Wood Central. Last year's game was close, and it should be this year considering the seniors they lose. Uh, both these teams are losing. And so this will be a hard-fought battle, but I trust the core of this Young Valley squad to find a way to get it done. Then they play Wellington, and Wellington, they're a new program. And I look, there's not much to know about them because they don't have much film on them yet, obviously, as they will be a new program, uh, period, coming into two-way this year. And this will be the first year of their program. So I'm going to go ahead and give them the dub here and take care of business because, you know, Valley has the more experienced group. They've been playing football together longer, and so they should beat them. But make no mistake, they need to be on their toes because you never know. You know, at this point in the season, Wellington could be on fire or they could be struggling. But regardless, you got to be ready for them. So there you go. Then they play Platte Valley. I think this Platte Valley squad is a playoff team and they're going to be very good. Probably a top five, top six team. And they're going to be dangerous this year. And so I think Platte Valley takes care of them. Then they play Prospect Ridge Academy. This should be a dub for Valley. This is another another winnable game for Valley against a 1A team. Uh, play Bennett. Same kind of deal. They should beat this 1A team, um, especially if the Valley quarterback is playing at a high level. So there you go. And then to end the season, they play the Evelyn. Uh, this the Evelyn team, in my opinion, is going to be very good this year. They're going to they have a lot of experience that they're bringing back all around, and uh, they're very talented too. And so they might just be outmatched. And so I'm going to give this one to the Evelyn here. Now, my predicted record. For Valley is five and four with a window of wins anywhere between three and five. Uh, this team will be interesting to follow considering they will be going to year two with a young quarterback and they are losing quite a bit from the skill players uh, who are leaving, but that'll leave opportunity for other players to step up. So there you go. Luckily, they have a much easier schedule this year, and so they should be able to go 500 or finish close to it. And you know, playing some of these easier teams will allow easier opportunities for players to, uh, to you know step up and stick out so we'll see how that goes but that's my prediction for valley high school all right now let's talk about a team that is in the same league as valley in wild central last year had an even tougher schedule and had an even tougher year they won two six and one tied a game with englewood to start the season 21 21 so that's interesting but then they beat arvada 40 to 7 then they lost to Florence 46-0, Highland 28-12, Sterling 40-26, did beat Fort Lupton 14-6 in a close one, but lost to Valley 28-16, Flat Valley 48-12, and then lost to Brush who went to state 56-13. Now, they do have some graduating seniors, including uh, Tenayden Thompson. I think that's how you say that. He was a senior quarterback last year. Threw for 454 yards, two touchdowns to seven picks. That's kind of a tough go, but did contribute 310 yards and three rushing touchdowns on the ground. And also 27 tackles on defense. And they're losing Zane Stam. He was probably one of their best athletes. He was their lead rusher with 1,162 yards and 14 rushing touchdowns. Also caught 11 balls for 211 yards and a receiving touchdown and then was a top tackler with 100 tackles and one interception on the season one of the few athletes to both rush 4,000 yards and have 100 tackles next to miles pool and probably mason quanch so there you go there that's a big loss that's not going to be an easy one to replace there then they're losing gunner hess uh he was the backup running back last year he had a 327 yards and a touchdown still production but on defense he was big time had 71 tackles and two sacks and was one of the top tacklers altogether wild central is losing seven of their 11 top tacklers from last year and on top of that they're losing everyone who had an interception as well so they're losing the majority of their secondary plus most of their defense here and so that's tough along with basically this backfield so Big losses here for Weld Central. Uh, I have two key players for them since this is going to be such a young team. Uh, Siler Troutner, he was, the, he was third in uh, tackles for this defense last year with 53 as a sophomore. And so look to him to step up more, of, uh, more as a leader as a junior and whatnot for this young team. Then you have Chad Dakinga. He had 35 tackles and a sack last year. Potentially another guy who should step up as a leader for this team going into this year. Now, let me go ahead and predict, predict the record here. 
against Bennett. 118, I think they're going to lose to them. Uh, Bennett is bringing back quite a bit and should be able to take advantage of a team that is losing their best athlete in the majority of their defense from last year. This is not exactly the greatest game to play to start the season, so there you go. Then they play Platte Valley. Like I said, Platte Valley is going to be very good this year, so I'm going to favor Platte Valley in this one. Then they play Fort Lupton. Uh, this will be a close game. May even be a game that could be flipped. But I'm going to favor Fort Lupton here. Wild Central will need to find a way to replace those contributors on offense. It's not going to be easy, but they got to find a way. And even if they do, the experience of those players may catch up to them in this close game. And so I have a couple concerns here about Wild Central here. But I, at the end of the day, I got to favor Fort Lupton. They just have more experience. And even last year's game was close. So just keep that in mind. So if it's another close game, I think I'm going with Fort, Fort Lupton here. Then they play Valley, just talked about them. This will be another close game, but I favor Valley here because of the experience they're returning. Um, wouldn't be surprised if they flip these two games, especially if those players they have in those new spots are stepping up. But I'm still going to go with my gut here and go with Valley. Then they play Sterling. This is probably going to be another close game, uh, but this time around, I still favor Sterling, even though it will be a rebuilding season for them because usually their talent pool is just better and so i think that's just gonna be enough to just barely edge out weld central this is definitely an opportunity for weld central to flip it though and take advantage of an even more inexperienced team in sterling so there you go then they play university i think this team's a playoff team in 2a and so i think university will take care of weld central then they play Brush. Brush may, may be losing a lot of the core from their state championship appearance team from last year, but they're well coached and they're returning enough players from the core for me to feel good enough uh, to go ahead and give this one to Brush. Then they play Tin. I think it's Timnith. Um, Timnith. They have a good. They have a very good talent pool. But they are a first-year program, and so I'm going to give this one to Weld Central because they have more experience. They've played together as a team longer. But don't be surprised if Timnith pulls this one out and wins. I'm going to give them this dub here for Weld Central solely because of experience. I'm just going to be honest. Then they play Arvada. Last year's game wasn't close. I don't think this year's game will be close either. And so my predicted record for Weld Central is 2-7 and seven with a window of wins between 2-4. and four. This team's facing another rebuild and will be struggling this season. They may find success at the end of the season as uh, their schedule eases up and the team Joe's better. But for now, I'm going to have to say that at most, I see maybe them winning four games, like at most, if their team is really gelling and doing their thing. But like I said, I think it's going to be a rebuilding season for Weld Central here. All right, now let's switch back to 4A and talk about Fruita Monument here. They had a very good season last year, 7-3 and in the regular season, 1-1 one and one in the playoffs. Um, they beat Highlands Ranch to start 42-17, then lost to Montrose in a close one, 26-22. Beat Grand Junction 47-7, lost to Chatfield 28-7, beat Grand Junction Central 14-7, beat Rampart 47-8, lost to Fountain Fort Carson 42-28. Beat Pueblo West 26-21, uh, beat Coronado 42-14, beat Mesa Ridge 36-35 in a close one. Uh, but then in the playoffs, absolutely beat down Bryden 63-26, then lost to Erie, who did go to state, 50-26. Now they are graduating some good players here, including Armani Trujillo. He was the third leading rusher on this team with 632 rushing yards and seven touchdowns. Was also a big time contributor on the defense with 75 tackles and two sacks as the sack or sorry as the tackle leader. And then he was second team all state for 4A. They're also losing Cole Jones. He was the lead receiver with 16 receptions for 543 yards and three touchdowns. They don't really pass it a lot, but when they did, he was a game changer, and so he will be missed. Uh, top of that, they're losing Peyton Nessler. He was their second leading receiver with 241 yards and three touchdowns on 16 receptions. Uh, he will be missed as well. Also contributed 38 tackles and two picks. They're losing Jens Tobiasen, I want to say. This 6'5 lineman was a top defender for this team with 26 tackles and 4 sacks on the season. And last but not least, they are losing Joseph Shepardson. He was an All-State honorable, uh, honorable Mention offensive lineman 
altogether losing six of their top 11 tacklers plus that lineman and some backups there now here are the key players for this food and monument squad as their core basically stays intact here uh so the returning Corbin Rowell as the junior starting quarterback he had a very solid year throwing for 1,140 yards 10 touchdowns and 7 picks while rushing for 285 yards and 9 touchdowns as a senior I think he's going to take a step forward he's a nice dual threat quarterback who could potentially you know have a breakout season and really take advantage of this strong running game he could also run as well so you got to look out for him so there you go then they're returning their lead back, their most productive back in Wyatt Sharp. He was the lead rusher for this team as a sophomore last year, going for 987 yards and 12 touchdowns while catching five receptions for 126 yards and two touchdowns. He should continue to get better each season, including this next junior year. So he should be uh, poised for a big one. Then you have Kaysen Stegelmeyer. Uh, he was the second, sorry, he was the second leading rusher uh, to Sharp, who rushed for 882 yards and seven touchdowns as that second uh, running back there. He also snagged 58 tackles on defense. He will be leading both the defense and helping out the offense for this team. So there you go. That is the core for Fruita Monument. You know they are losing some players on defense, some important players on defense and alignment, but. This core was a big part of why they were so successful. And so let's go ahead and predict the record for this season. They play Grand Junction Central to start. I think this is a dub for Food and Monument. Last year's game was close, and this year's game will probably be close as well. But I trust this experienced backfield to go ahead and take care of business. Then they play Montrose. Uh, last year was a close game, but this year, Food and Monument, they have the edge and experience by a lot, uh, especially with this backfield, and they should find a way to go ahead and beat them. Will be a hard fought game, though. Then they play Skyline. <sighs> this will be a dub, but it's going to be a tough game as they got a squad up over there at Skyline and a very good quarterback. The defense will need to do their part for Fruit and Monument so that the offense can control the pace of the game. I think that is the keys to success for Fruit and Monument in this game. That's what they've done before, and so if they could control the pace of this game, get out to an early lead, and then their defense does their thing, I think they go ahead and squeeze out a close dub against a very good Skyline team. Then they play Grandview, and I think this one's going to be a loss. This Grandview team is returning an excellent quarterback and Liam Zarka. I'm a big fan of his. I think he's a top three quarterback in the state. And this Grandview front seven is going to be nasty, one of the best in the state. And so this may be a close one if the offense is on top of their game. But Grandview is going to come to play, and they just have a lot of talent over there. So, you know, nope. I don't think this will be too big of a surprise if Grandview beats them, though. Then they play Bear Creek, should beat them. Bear Creek is losing quite a bit of talent, and so they should take advantage of that. Um, same thing with Heritage. You know, Heritage, I think they're going to be better this season compared to last year, but Fruit of Monument should go ahead and get a dub with the experience they have and the talent they have on this team and take care of business. Um, then they play Grand Junction. They should beat them there. They play Aurora Central next. I think they get the dub, but it's going to be a close game. Uh, Aurora Central, they have a very good backfield as well. They have a talented one uh, as well, but I think it's going to come down to the defenses. And so this may be a toss-up game, but I think this Fruit of Monument defense at this point of the season should be pretty... I mean, you know, they should be um, at a solid point. You know, they should be gelling at this point, and so I think they could handle Aurora Central. But I think, really, it's going to come down to the defenses in that game. Should be a close one. That's probably a toss-up game. Could go either way. Then they play Broomfield. This is a team that has a talented quarterback in Cola Crew uh, and a defense that should be decent along with a running back. But unfortunately, I'm not sure if Broomfield has enough firepower for them to beat a Fruit of Monument team that could really control the pace of the game if they fall behind. And, you know, Broomfield last year, they struggled with falling behind. This year, they're losing a ton of receivers. And so I don't know what that receiving core is going to look like. And so I think Fruit of Monument should beat Broomfield. If they beat Aurora Central, then they should beat Broomfield here. But it's going to be a hard fought game. They're going to have to be on their toes here. Then they play Adam City. I think they should beat them. So all together, my predicted record for Fruta Monument 
is 9 and 1 with a window of wins anywhere between 7 and 9. This is a talented team. They will have a dangerous backfield that could lead this team back to the playoffs and make another, you know, pretty deep playoff run. The Aurora Central, Broomfield, and Skyline games uh, can all be game changers for them this season. And honestly, they should show where this team is as far as contending and all that great stuff goes. Now, the defense for this Fruit of Monument team, they're going to have to figure out some spots. Players are going to have to step up here. And if they do, I think they're going to make this team very legitimate, legitimate contenders going into this season. But for now, you know, I think this is a team that should for sure make the playoffs. We'll see how well they do against some of these better teams. All right, now let's talk about another team that has a very uh, similar game plan to Food of Monument, and that is Montrose. Last year, they were 10-0 in the regular season, 2-1 in the playoffs just came short of state uh, they're undefeated beating grand junction central 46 6 beating fruit of monument 26 22 beating durango 39 7 being palisade 35 7 beating grand junction 54 7 beating palmer ridge in a close one 28 21 uh beating heritage 56 12 beating vista ridge 42 28 beating air academy 50 to 7 beating ponderosa in a close one 19 to 14 and then in the playoffs they beat denver south 56 to 19 and then beat fountain for carson 48 to 14 and then finally lost to erie in a close game this was a comeback win for erie 29 to 28 definitely a game they should have won and uh you know went to state but couldn't quite get it done there now they are graduating a lot of seniors here a lot of guys part of that core including ethan hartman he was their lead rusher with 1138 yards and 13 touchdowns also caught 23 receptions for 627 yards and six touchdowns and then contributed on defense 49 tackles and three picks uh was an all-state second team db so that's a big loss then they're losing Austin Griffin, their second leading rusher, who had 987 yards and 25 touchdowns as more of the power back for this team. Also contributed 41 tackles on defense. Then they're losing Gabe Miller. He contributed 438 rushing yards and two touchdowns on offense. He had 41 tackles and two picks on defense. And then uh, they're losing Bodie Griner. He was a second team All-State linebacker who led this team with 153 tackles. That might be close to uh, leading the entire state in tackles. Then he also had four and a half sacks and two picks. And then they're losing uh, as well. Jeez, they're just losing a lot of players. But they're also losing Tante uh, Ila. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. But on offense, he contributed 215 yards and four touchdowns. On defense, he was a tackle leader with 60 tackles. And then last but not least, they're losing Ashton Oberg. The 6'5 pass rusher had 60 tackles and then 13 and a half sacks for this Montrose team, uh, leading them in sacks. He also caused six fumbles altogether. This defense is losing seven of their ten or seven of their top 11 tacklers from last year in addition to three of their lead backs from last year so this montrose team is losing a lot as most people know they run that wing tee then they play very very good defense and so even though we don't condone using the wing tee personally here on the podcast you know it is just one of those systems where if you're running it right and if you're coaching them up right it's pretty much easy to replace the players there most of the players are usually replaceable as long as you have athletes and that's what Monchos has so let's talk about some key players starting with their starting quarterback Gage Wareham uh, started as a sophomore went for 1069 yards and 10 touchdowns to two picks look for him to take on a bigger role for this offense and take a step forward maybe they pass it a little bit more with Gage here. Then you have Blake Griffin. No, not the basketball player, but the running back. About a whole foot shorter though, but he is the only running back from last year's backfield to return that got significant carries. He had 598 yards and 12 touchdowns last year, so look for him to be the main back in a backfield that relies on multiple guys to run the ball so it won't just be him but he should be the main guy there then you have Demarion Lopez he was a big DT uh, defensive tackle that will return for them uh, he snagged 45 tackles three and a half sacks and 15 tackles for losses as a junior uh, defense should really build around him here uh, should be a good one to have back then you have Tori Eckerman he had 62 tackles on the season and will be a big 
a big part of this defense that is just not returning a lot. So, you know, you have some guys to work with here. You got two guys in the backfield. You got a big lineman. You have a, uh, I think he's either a linebacker or a safety here in Torrey. And so you have some guys to kind of rebuild your team around. But it's going to be tough, you know, because this beginning of their season is very, very tough. They play Palmer Ridge, Fruita Monument, and Erie to start the season. And in my opinion, I think all three of those games will most likely be losses. Uh, each of these teams, first off, are just returning way more than Montrose. Don't get it twisted, though. Montrose will make them work for those wins, so they won't be easy games. Some of them may be flippable, I think. I think most of them will probably be flippable. Um, considering, you know, the system they run there and whatnot, but I am concerned about how fast uh, or how well some of these inexperienced backs will do to start the season. So we'll see there, but I think those will be losses for Montrose to start. But after that, I think they will rattle off some wins against Palisade, Lutheran, Grand Junction Central, Falcon, Coronado, and Mesa Ridge. Those teams have talent, but this Montrose program is one that, especially in the last couple years, uh, they have replaced talent relatively well. You know, like I said, not super hard of a system to run offensively. And so uh, I think plus they just have more talent than those squads. So they should be able to beat all of those teams in a row. Then they play Pueblo West. This one might be more of a toss-up game compared to, you know, those tougher teams they play at the beginning of the season. But it's going to be a test for the defense, uh, who by now should gel, you know, should have a lot of experience on this win streak. But this is a game that they cannot win if their defense is not playing at a high level. And on top of that, you know, their offense, you got to, I mean, you know, you got to be productive. You got to control the pace. But to beat Pueblo West, your defense has to be playing at a high level. I think they can, but I think this is still going to be a close game, though. And so I'm going to go ahead and give this one to Pueblo West. And so my predicted record for Montrose is 6-4 and four, with a window of wins anywhere between 6 and 9. Nice. They really shouldn't drop below 6 losses this season. Um, or sorry, below six wins this season, in my honest opinion. And that isn't thanks to the coaching they have over there in a system that forces other teams to be physical and brutal up front. The only concern I have are the losses that this defense is suffering. You know, those aren't going to be easy players to replace, but they're going to have to and whatnot. And so the next group of defenders will need to understand that they have to step up. If they do, then I wouldn't be surprised seeing them beat a Palmer Ridge, through the Monument, Erie, or a Pueblo West, which are all winnable games in my opinion, but I gotta see what this defense does first. You know, offensively, I'm not as concerned. Uh, defensively, though, they gotta step up, so we'll see about Montrose. All right, now let's move back to 5A and let's talk about Castleview to go ahead and wrap up this episode here. Last year, won 6 and 4, own 1 in playoffs. Uh, lost, to, or sorry, beat Heritage 27 0, beat Fairview 38 21, beat Rangeview 52 21. Then lost this rivalry game to Douglas County, Battle of the Rock 16 to 0. Bounce back, beat Hinkley 56 8, beat Highlands Ranch in a close one, by the way, 21 14. Lost to Valor Christian 47 14. Lost to Thunder Ridge 38 3. Uh, beat Mountain Vista in another close one 42 41. Then lost to Rock Canyon 21 14. And then in the first round of the playoffs, I was at this playoff game. Lost to Pomona 14 7. That one was definitely a winnable game. But we'll talk more about what happened in that game and, uh, you know, some of the players that need to step up after watching that playoff game. But let's talk about some of the graduating seniors because they are losing some very, very important players, including Mark Westbecker. He was their lead rusher who went for 805 yards and eight touchdowns, also contributed 20 tackles on defense. Then they're losing Blake Haggerty. Uh, he made our top five senior list, but, you know, he had 37 receptions for 474 yards and 5 touchdowns. Also had 49 tackles on defense and 2 picks at corner. Then they're losing Herschel Craig the third. He was a top edge rusher in last year's class. He made our list. He had 52 tackles and 4.5 and sacks on the season. To top that, they're also losing Brody Ashworth, who was one of the top linebackers statistically in the state last year. He went for 132 tackles, 2.5 sacks, snagged 3 interceptions. He will be sorely missed for this team because he cleaned up a lot for this defense whenever uh, they missed. So there you go. And then last but not least, you got Beto Ledesma. He was an honorable 
honorable mention for our safeties list. Uh, he had 98 tackles on the year, and he was a top tackler altogether. Castleview is losing seven of their top 11 tacklers, their top four sack leaders, and their interception leaders. So they're losing a lot. You know, they're losing a lot, but they are returning some players still. You know, they have a pretty good talent pool there. And I think it starts with their quarterback, their senior quarterback, Nathan Schmidt. He passed for 942 yards, 11 touchdowns, 7 picks, rushed for 384 yards and 7 touchdowns. Um, I'm not going to lie. He missed opportunities last season, and he needs to be better. I know he's not owning up to it, but he absolutely needs to be better. 45% pass percentage is not good, and he needs to be way more efficient. In that Pomona game, he basically threw a easy screen pass into the ground. If they got it, then they would have got the first down, and that drive would have probably resulted in a touchdown because the screen was wide open. Um, but he missed it, and that wasn't the only pass he missed. He missed a couple other passes in that Pomona game, in that Douglas County game, and so moving forward as a senior, you know, he absolutely needs to step up for this Castleview team to find success. Uh, he just needs to. You know, you can't have the same year you had last year. You have to be better. Uh, so there you go. But they are bringing back Joe Asserta, who should help him out. He was the second leading rusher with 723 yards and five touchdowns. Should be the main guy now that Wes Becker left and should fill in nicely and, you know, replicate a lot of that production on offense. Then you got Ace Malone, the 6'3 speedster senior, should turn all the way up and have an excellent season. He'll help out Schmidt here. Uh, he could be a vertical and jump ball threat for them. But, I mean, you know, he still has some things to prove here, you know, has some, you know, more technical things that he could have worked on as a receiver. And I think he has. And so going into this year, he should be the wideout one. We are really excited for him. He's definitely on our radar as a top five senior wide receiver, but we will see. He does have the athletic tools, though. I will give him that. And then last but not least, you got Peyton Walker. He will be a senior linebacker this year, but contributed greatly as a junior snagging 74 tackles he should help fill uh some of the voids left in this castleview defense and whatnot and lead that castleview defense so there you go now let me go ahead and predict the record against lewis palmer they should beat them against doherty they should win that one this may potentially be a close one but the offense needs to take control and win them this game i think it'll really come down to that uh because you're gonna have a very young defense so there you go then they play pooter the confidence of this team should be up going into this game, assuming they are 2-0, and so that should be a dub for Castleview. Um, like I said, this really depends on whether the offense is clicking or not. If they're not, then you know maybe they don't win that game, but they should. Then they play Legend. That should be a dub. They have they don't have a lot of experience, so there should be no excuses as to why you can't beat them. So there you go. Then you play Douglas County. This is a rematch. This is a rivalry game. This might be the game changer of your season. I'm not going to lie because it is kind of more at the midway point compared to last year. And so this is absolutely an important game outside of it being a rivalry game. Like I said, if you can go, go to this game. Um, but this will probably be the first real test of the season and both teams should come out swinging. I have Castleview avenging their loss from last year. This win won't come easily though. You know, you'll know how tough this Castleview team is on whether they beat Douglas County or not. And so we'll see about that. That might affect some of the games moving forward here, not going to lie. But after that, they play Cherokee Trail. Assuming they beat Douglas County, I have them beating Cherokee Trail, who is losing a lot of talent now. The only way they lose to them is if Cherokee Trail has some extraordinary players who catch fire and are on fire here mid-season, or I guess a little bit after mid-season. But... Castleview, they're much more experienced. They shouldn't let this inexperienced team beat them. Then they play Valor Christian. Valor may be losing talent, but they're not losing that much talent. That should be a loss for Castleview. Then they play Thunder Ridge. The Thunder Ridge defense is going to be tough. You know, they're basically returning everyone from last year. And so other than Valor, this will probably be the toughest defense this team faces all season. Also throwing the possibility that DJ Bordeaux plays. And honestly, I think DJ is a better quarterback than Schmidt. I don't think that's crazy to say here. I think Thunder Ridge basically wins this game. Uh, then after that, you have Mountain Vista. Last year's game was close. They pulled it out. I think this year's game will still be close, but I don't think they're going to pull it out. 
this young Mountain Vista team is growing up, and they're going to be a threat to the state this season. So I think Mountain Vista is going to win this one. Then they play Rock Canyon. This should be a close game, but Rock Canyon is returning all the same players who had great games against uh, Castleview last season. Definitely a flippable game. Don't get it twisted. You know, but I'm going to give the slight edge, and I mean slight edge, to Rock Canyon in this one. Then they play Highlands Ranch. This may be a close game, but I think they win this one to end the season. Uh, I, yeah, I don't see them losing that game. So altogether, my predicted record for Castle View is seven and four, with a window of wins anywhere between five and seven. Look, this team doesn't have an overly difficult schedule to start the season, and that might actually affect how the end of the season goes. If they're feeling themselves and they're on a roll, they're on a win streak, then they may be able to win one of the games against either Valor, Thunder Ridge, or Mountain Vista. Potentially, not all of them, but they'll be able to win probably one of those. Now, like I said, I think this Douglas County game will be key. If they lose that one, then they might stumble a little bit and then we'll see, but Altogether, I still have Castleview winning more games than losing them. All right, there you go. That wraps up this episode and the season previews. Uh, look, once again, if you're not happy with the season preview, you could always prove us wrong, but there's reasons why we have it, and I would definitely tell you the same thing to your face. So there you go, but look out for the rest of the season previews. For the rest of the teams in Colorado, we are previewing every, I mean every, 11-man football team here in the state of Colorado before the season starts. That's 1 through 5A slash 6A. And so if you want to stay updated, know when episodes are dropping, go ahead and follow us on social media. Show us some love on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Playmakers Corner. And then you could go ahead and subscribe, follow us on TikTok, YouTube, Twitch. We'll be posting content there. I know Cody will be coming out with a live stream here probably soon. I might be doing a live stream here as well bringing that back uh in case you missed the live stream they will be uploaded on youtube in full unedited so that you could check it out and then on our tiktoks you know there are little clips from each episode so in case you just want to listen to one team and the gist of it you can find those there and on our youtube channel as well they're uh uploaded as short so there you go thank you for rocking with us tune in for cody's episode on wednesday and then our joint episode on Friday, but until then, we will catch you later.